we go. Since we're up. Okay, we're going to design water's future in 10 minutes or less. But we're going to start with, how many people are feeling hydrated after that? Everybody good? Climate change, everything else? If you're not, I'd suggest you seek some water because the first sign of dehydration is dizziness and fatigue. Second sign, confusion. Yeah, maybe a little hint there. Uh, nausea, third. Blurred vision, okay, maybe a little sign of that too. Seizures and loss of cons consciousness, okay. And finally, death. Well, we have our little blue planet, which Sebastian so uh, succinctly described here. And talking about Houston, we have a problem. We have a global water problem. Our blue planet's thirsty. Have we lost our vision, perhaps? So on our board is Jerry Leninger, an astronaut. He spent four months in this spaceship, the Mir, which was held together by his terms of basically duct tape and bailing wire. And this is the response he gave me when I asked him about water, looking down in this blue planet, when on the space station, literally they made their water from sweat and urine in space. Talk about a circular economy, right? So a closed ecosystem, only so many sources of life-sustaining water, and all the creatures of Earth just like the three of us circling it, all dependent on water. Imagine being in your own ecosystem, looking down on this blue planet. He actually ended up building a home on the shore of the Great Lakes, so he would literally always have fresh water outside his front door. So Jerry told me, he sent me this picture. These are dust storms starting over Inner Mongolia, and they blow all the way to Beijing, all the way to Los Angeles. So I asked Jerry, what would happen if I dropped a golf ball out of the space station? He said, well, that's not really physically possible. But, okay, theoretically, if I dropped a golf ball out of the space station, where would it land at the start of this dust storm? So we in journalism, I'm a journalist and photographer, um, we use a little secret, it's called IWT, and that's how we get our stories. I was there. So I went there, literally, to the location, and this is what I found. I found some of the biggest coal mines in China, powering China's entire GDP economy. This was, what, five or six years ago. And I also, up here, this is where I theoretically landed out of the space station, bounced a few times, um, but I landed in the front yard of Wu Yun. She's the daughter of an inner Mongolian shepherd family. And Wu Yun told me about how their well had gone dry and how the coal mines have taken their water, both for processing coal and for cooling the power plants. So these are some of, I mean, we're hearing horrible statistics, right? I'm kind of documenting our own demise, but don't worry, we'll bring it around. Um, so, Sebastian mentioned how many million people will be on the move. This is a really scary number up in the upper right. 700 million people potentially on the move because of water scarcity or seeking water one way or another by 2030. That's in 10 years, folks. So, I went to Sao Paulo to see where some of these people are moving to. So a lot of these slums in really poor areas, the barrios, these streets are named after the villages and the streets where that, that they left behind in the drought-stricken areas of Brazil, literally in Sao Paulo. So severe water stress, so we're looking at what we call day zero cities, cities where some people may actually have to go further to, for water or water scarcity becomes so high it really stresses the urban system. Some names that you recognize here. So something else we need to talk about too is make these connections. Climate is water. When we're talking about climate change, we're really talking about the impact on water. Will there be less? Will there be more? Droughts, floods? And how do we manage our pollution? Because if we had polluted water and less of it, there's less water for everything. So we're seeing more and more the future is here today. It's here ahead of schedule. And this is what I saw in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. So this was perhaps one of the last rice harvests in this region of the Delta because of salinification. The rice fields are actually turning brown. So they've pumped, they both pumped their groundwater as well as sea level rise. And that's happening now. That's literally the Mekong behind. This used to be a rice paddy here. So if we don't believe in sea level rise, just look at the Mekong. On that day, it was a new record of salt water measured upstream on the Mekong of 78 kilometers. So this is Delhi. Count how many water tanks there are on these rooftops. And there are two people in the city down here on the right. <laughs> so there are thousands of, of undocumented wells in many of the locations around the world, many of these large urban centers. This happens to be one in Delhi. So in many ways, we don't actually have the data to measure uh, how much groundwater there is and who's pumping it and at what rates. Well, what happens when the groundwater 
is depleted. You turn to other sources. So this is a rice paddy north of Delhi, and it didn't smell like a normal rice paddy. It didn't even smell like sewage. It smelled like industrial waste. So I went upstream, literally, and this is what I found. This was the water source that they were using for their rice paddies. So heavy metals, all the other fun outputs and effluents from paper mills upstream are becoming their water source. Imagine that in the food supply, affecting the food supply. So Saudi Arabia, so this is a Somali farmer I found who'd moved from Somalia looking for more water and moving, moving his, his sheep and becoming a shepherd in Saudi Arabia. So climate refugees. Australia, Australia is of course in the news and it's absolutely heartbreaking. And you have people like Beryl Carmichael who are Aboriginal elders whose entire history flows through water and the Murray and the Darling Rivers. Their dream time relates to water and we can learn a lot about how they measure and how they value and how they manage their water supply. So Jakarta, probably most people heard that Jakarta's sinking. Most people heard that they announced they're moving the capital of Indonesia, right, from Jakarta. Well, on the morning they announced they're moving the capital, don't hang out with me, I was standing, that's, that's the famous seawall that wraps around Jakarta, right up there. So literally I got a text and I said, oh, I'm in the wrong place. The city's sinking, they're moving. So the world is not a click away. We talk about technological solutions. Well, some of the technological solutions are more behavioral and social than hard science and hard numbers because sometimes our assumptions of data supply and data access are a little off of reality, perhaps. This is the data center at the Punjab Department of Irrigation. So I was really careful when I took this picture not to wake up the servers. They were asleep in the corner. Data joke. Um, so what we also have, though, is we have people in some of the poorest parts of the world, the wealthiest parts of the world, who are, I would say, unempowered data collectors. We have to, as Sebastian said, we have to have the voice. That's our most powerful thing, the voice and the data collection and the stories. This river foams every day. Literally, the bottoms of my shoes fell off later. We're losing the battle, folks. How do we pull this back? Here in Jakarta, this guy delivers the water twice a day to his clients. That push cart weighs 1,000 pounds or more. So we have the, te the technology. What we have is really a catastrophic failure of public policy. We have incrementalism. We pilot project things. Instead of flying the airplane, we drive around in the runways. And we are failing. We fail in the water sector again and again and again. How do we turn this around? What's missing? Whose voice is missing? And how do we listen better? How do we take this to scale? Yes, you know, we're, <laughs> we're the Marvel superheroes. Well, I think we're actually all here. That's what's really cool about the DLD community. Truly to take on these grand challenges, and water I think is one of, the, one of the most productive stories for us to tackle, is to activate the collective genius of data experts, scientists, storytellers, young people, governments, companies, and the public. Not just tell them what to do with a new brand or come up with a new slogan, but give them something to do, a way to be relevant in the story. This is how we design water's future. We design it by understanding people's perception and comparing it real time to reality and understanding the context. What's that farmer thinking? Why is he pumping water 24 seven out of the ground to irrigate crops that don't need irrigation? Why is he doing that? Why is he not your champion? So using AI and different, different processes, we can do this much faster. We can course correct that airplane. So what we're doing is launching a project called Designing Water's Future. We did this 12 years ago out of the World Economic Forum. We're doing it again, but at scale. We didn't have the technology then. In our session in Davos, Mark Zuckerberg was in the back. I think he had his first hoodie then. Um, so now we have all these new tools that are bringing us together to crowdsource story and stories and data, visualize in multi-dimensions in ways that we've never done before. Why is this technology just for the military and not for these grand challenges? And then applying this to a global academic design challenge. How do we tell this story better? How do we create the systems and the processes? How do we actually design water's future? So how many of you, if you have a blue card, everybody get it, not everybody, but some people got a card. Okay, didn't have one for everybody. If you have a blue card, hold that up. Great, we've got some blue cards. So you guys are the listeners and the storytellers, okay? So those with the yellow cards, Hint, hint, okay, those are the yellow cards. You guys are the scientists and the technologists. And you guys with the orange cards, what do you think that'll be? 
you're the designers, you're the ones that are giving us this, this process, the system's designed to get us there. Not just a logo, but a design, a process. And then the green, you're probably just as important or more so. You're the connectors, you're the ones that are going to piece this together. So together then, we are designing Water Suture. If everybody had a card, I'd have you stand up and shout, I am designing Water Suture. You can do it if you want. <laughs> but truly, this is a quote from the Chief Creative Officer at Chobani. The only hope for Water Suture is the one that we deliberately design. We can't be passive on the sidelines, nor can we expect our people on the ground, whether they're in the poor areas of Jakarta or on the shores of the Great Lakes, we can't expect them to be passive. We have to give them something to do because we are inspiring. We have a generation behind us that is truly inspiring. These women, young women, walk for hours a day near the border of Pakistan and India just to get water. And kids that grow up without adequate water, they grow up dehydrated, they actually grow up with a lower IQ. So, what are we adding? I would argue that we are all, and it's my personal mission here, is to make hope visible and make it, make it actionable, make it move, because we are designing Water's future because we have to, and we have to do it together. So I'd ask you all, this is your activation, what's your superpower? What are you going to add? So thank you. <laughs>